start the Atlantic Herring section meeting uh, a little bit late. We apologize. Uh, executive committee ran over just a tad. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we're gonna, we've, we've got a few additional items on the agenda, but before we go there, um, <clears throat> both of the other two commissioners from the state of Maine were not able to attend today. This is their busy time of year, uh, both Steve Train from a lobstering perspective and Senator Langley uh, because of his restaurant uh, in Ellsworth. So uh, I'm it. So my plan is to chair this meeting um, and if I get into a, so we get into a situation where I have to advocate on behalf of Maine on a specific position, I will turn the meeting over to, uh, to Bob uh, in regards to uh, running that portion of the meeting as it, um, if we have to make any motions. So anybody have any objections to that approach? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, you have objections to that approach, Tony? Okay. <laughs> Jesus, don't confuse me. Um, so um, we do have some additional items on the agenda that we'll take up under other business. Uh, one is revisiting the issue regarding uh, moving the board, uh, moving the section and creation and turning it into a board. Uh, this is a result of conversations that leadership from the council and the commission had, and Bob can uh, give some additional uh, information when that uh, portion comes up. And because of that conversation, because we're going to deal with some of the uh, issues related to uh, the council work on the on the um, uh, on A8. Uh, Peter Kendall, who is the Herring Committee Chair, is here in a great spirit of cooperation. Uh, he expected to be hiding in the back of the room, but I said, uh, no, he, with that shirt on, he needs to sit up at the front. <laughs> um, and then we also have AP nominations. Is is there any other business to be brought before the section? Richie, did you want to address? Uh, we had discussed uh, talking about spawning uh, issues going forward. Um, is this something that you would like to delay till the October meeting? Because we're a little bit behind schedule, why don't we um, put it at the end of the agenda? If we get to it today, we can start the conversation. Um, and then if we don't have additional time, we can finish it in October. So any other additional items for the section? Seeing none, um, the proceedings from the May 2018 meeting were in your packet. Uh, is there any additions, deletions, corrections to those proceedings? Seeing none, the, um, I will take that as uh, approval of the proceedings from the, 20, uh, the May 2018 meeting. It, we've got a few folks from the public here today. Uh, are there any public comments on items that are not on the agenda? Seeing none. We'll go to item number four, review and consider approval of the 2018 uh, Atlantic Herring Benchmark ass uh, Assessment. Uh, and uh, there potentially is an action here, but because the peer review has not been completed, uh, we are in a little bit of a quandary. So. We may want to uh, we may want to consider a motion that is conditional in its approach, um, but I think we can we'll go through the reports um, uh, from both Matt Sierra uh, and you're going to do uh, are you doing the presentation on periods? There will be none. There will be none. So we're going to have a presentation. The, the, the agenda is incorrect. We'll have a presentation on the stock assessment from Matt. Uh, and we'll, uh, after he presents the stock assessment report, we'll review uh, the comments of the peer review as followed, the presentation, there'll be a few time for questions and comments, um, and then we'll figure out what our path forward will be from there. So with that, Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Pat. So uh, my name is Matt Seri. Uh, I work for the Maine Department of Marine Resources. <clears throat> I'm on the Herring PDT, uh, the Herring Technical Committee, as well as the work group that, that did the SARC this year. So um, this presentation is for the, the stock assessment that we completed this past June, well, this past May, and was actually peer reviewed in June. Um, some of these slides have been ripped off from John DeRobo. He's the primary uh, analyst for Atlantic Caring from the Population Dynamics Center. Next slide. 
So back in 2012, um, we had a little bit of a retrospective pattern associated with the stock. Um, and that tended to overestimate uh, SSB and underestimate F in the terminal year. Next slide, please. So one of the, one of the ways to fix this sort of problem um, was to increase the natural mortality rate by about 50% um, uh, starting in about 1993. When we did that, we noticed that it actually changed the um, natural mortality rate so that it sort of matched the consumption seen by the Food Habits Database from the bottom trial for National Marine Fishery Service. And so on the, let's see, on this axis we have consumption or the um, associated consumption. Year is on the Y, I mean uh, year is on the X, sorry. Um, the dotted line uh, is what happens when you, uh, from the model, if you assume that sort of natural mortality, what that sort of translates in as far as consumption goes. And the orange and black lines are the actual sort of measured uh, or model consumption from the NIMS bottom trough food habits database. And as you can see, they, they pretty much line up fairly well. Um, and this is when we actually increase the natural mortality rate uh, by about 50% um, in 1993. Next slide. So we got through that assessment. Um, it sort of helped the retrospective pattern immensely, um, and so we moved on. And then we went to go update the assessment in 2015, and we did exactly the same sort of run where we broke the natural mortality and sort of increased it by about 50%. And afterwards, it didn't seem to match the consumption quite so well. Um, more to the point, it actually didn't really solve the retrospective pattern anymore. Um, and so, uh, next slide. So we were kind of left with this whole issue of we've got a retrospective pattern that's overestimating uh, um, SSB and underestimating F relative to the terminal year. Um, so we ended up simply getting through that, uh, because that was an update and not a benchmark, all we did was do a, a Mons Row correction. Uh, basically, we correct downward for SSB um, and upwards for F in the terminal year uh, to figure out stock status. So this year, in 2018, we went through and we, we did a continuity run, which is basically we just take the last model, we put new data in it, and we run it. And when we do that, you'll notice a couple of things. The, the first is the blue line is the 2015 run. There's SSB here on the top panel. The blue line is the, S, is the SSB from the 2015 run. The red line is the SSB if we simply just updated the information, right? If we just simply put in new data. And that black diamond there is the retrospective adjustment that we did in the two, uh, 2015 assessment. So one of, the, one of the first things that you'll notice is our retrospective adjustment in 2015 seemed to be fairly dead on. Um, it actually brought that, that spotting stock biomass down in, in the final year um, to, to what we think it is. But that there's a very large difference between um, just simply adding in the data. Um, and this is all due to the retrospective pattern change. So not only does the retrospective pattern sort of change things in the terminal year, but it also changes things back further. You'll see that throughout the entire time series, or nearly the entire time series, back to almost 1989, you're actually ratcheting down spawning stock biomass. And you can also see that the recruitment, the differences in recruitment between the blue line and the red line are also fairly significant, ratcheting down what we've seen in recruitment over the last few years as well. So next slide. So it was pretty, it was pretty clear, um, oh sorry, one more slide on retrospective patterns, sorry about that. Um, for those people who are familiar with this type of thing, we're looking at a Moans row in the terminal year of about 0.73. Um, that's actually pretty darn high. Um, so it was pretty clear that this re active retrospective pattern was going to preclude us from simply doing a simple update. So next slide, please. 
So it was back to the drawing board. Um, so this is something that's you know, not unexpected, but what we ended up doing was actually taking a look at a, a few different, different types of modeling approaches. Um, we basically just started from scratch again, um, which is something that you can do in a, in a benchmark assessment. It's always something, I think it's always a good idea to at least take a look at. So we took a look at three different models. We looked at ASAP, which is the model that we've used previously and, and actually what's our base run for this time around. We also looked at SAM, um, which is a state space model um, that's currently in use a lot in ICES for Baltic herring and North Sea herring. And we also use SS3, which is something that's used out on the West Coast quite a bit. Um, the stock synthesis, the SS3 model uh, that was developed uh, uh, was done by SMAS and it was actually spatially explicit. Um, it had a lot of issues, in particular because we don't really know a lot of the migration rates back and forth between the subcomponents of Atlantic herring. And also partially because when you catch herring in sort of these mixed areas, you really can't identify what's Georgia's bank and what's Gulf of Maine herring. As, as some of you may already know, herring are sort of, are, are sort of broken into two large subcomponents, the Gulf of Maine spawning component and the Georgia's bank spawning component and we assess them together, but they do tend to mix together during times in which they're not spawning. So when they're feeding, they tend to be a little bit fairly, fairly well mixed. However, they do are separate spawning components. Um, and so that's a very complex thing for a, a, a model to actually go through and look at, particularly when you don't have the data. So the SAM model um, that we took a look at was actually kind of definitely, definitely cool but the work group wasn't quite as familiar with this sort of formulation, um, and so we relied almost exclusively on the ASAP model. There are some appendix, there's an appendix and a working paper that deals with the SAM model, as well as comparisons between ASAP and the SAM model, and there are some fairly significant differences. Next slide, please. So let's start off with fishery dependent data. Stop me if I'm boring you. <laughs> um, so fishery dependent data, one of the first things that we have actually is catch, of course. Um, as you can see, there's, um, you know, year is on the Y, catch, uh, uh, I'm sorry, year is on the X, um, uh, catch is on the Y, and we have two separate fleets in this particular model formulation. One is fixed gear, um, which isn't gill nets, uh, like most people think, but is actually stop stains, weirs, and uh, pound nets. Um, these are fixed stationary gear, gears used predominantly in Maine, but also in a few other places, as well as New Brunswick, Canada. Um, there's also the mobile gear fleet, which is purse seines and midwater trawlers, you know, that you guys are more familiar with. And as you can see, catches were really high back here uh, during the ICNAF fisheries when the Russians were um, uh, in uh, the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's bank before the 200 mile limit. Um, catches sort of declined in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, and then rebounded again and been on a slight decline ever since. Next slide, please. So the other thing that we have in fishery dependent data, of course, is, is age sampling. Um, and this is actually a very important part for an age structured model, as you can possibly imagine. Um, so on this axis, we have year, and on this axis, we have age. The bubbles that you see here represent the proportion um, of the catch that is that age. And if you follow this sort, of, this sort of bubble plot, you can make out that there are some very strong year classes. There's strong year classes back here, and then more recently there's a strong year class here with the 2008 year class and then the 2011 year class, right? What I want to show you here in particular is what you don't see. And what you're not seeing are age twos and age threes in the 2015, 2016 range. This represents sort of a hole in the, in the age structure of Atlantic herring. And we'll get into why in a few minutes. Next slide, please. We also have weights at age. Uh, we've had a dramatic change, a dramatic shift in weight and age in this population. It was much higher back here in the, in the 70s, 80s, and almost to the early 90s, but then it dropped precipitously, I'm sorry, in the mid-1980s. Since then, it's been variable, but it's stayed about the same level. 
Next slide. Okay, so the other thing that comes into this, uh, of course, for, for any type of modeling approach is to look at maturity. Um, and maturity is actually a really important component when you start trying to figure out things like spawning stock biomass. You need to know how many, how many fish are mature before you can figure out you know, how much spawning stock biomass you have. And so we went through and we did this again from scratch. And what I want to show you um, is the black line here is the maturity schedule. And you can see that um, it's near zero for age one fish, goes up to age two by a little bit, is almost 50% mature at age three, and is nearly about 90% mature by age four. Right? Next slide. What you can see here, again, is by age four, they're nearly fully mature. However, the selectivity is measured by the model um, this time around shows that they're not actually fully selected by the fishery at age four. In fact, they're less than 50% um, selected by age four. In this model formulation, they're not actually fully selected. They're not fully exposed to the fishing mortality until they're age seven. So they mature at age three and four. They're not fully actually exposed to the fishery until age seven. Next slide. We also looked at some other data um, to round out our fishery dependent stuff. Uh, this other data includes uh, some of the observer data, the at sea observer data uh, from National Marine Fisheries Service, um, as well as uh, the flounders, uh, the fishery logbook and data recording software that's new uh, this year. And mostly what this was doing was just trying to take a look at whether or not discarding was an issue. Um, for lots of years now, it's, it's been believed, and actually there, there's a lot of data to support, that relative to Atlantic herring catch, Atlantic herring discards in the Atlantic herring fishery are fairly minimal. Next slide, please. All right, on, on to fishery deep, uh, independent data. So we've got only a, a certain number of, of trawl surveys in which to actually take a look at. Um, we have the spring and the fall National Marine Fisheries Service uh, bottom trawl sampling, right? So we, that's a fishery in, uh, independent survey. Previously, and again this time around, we've broken them into time series. Um, the first time series for National Marine Fisheries Service bottom trawl uh, sampling occurs prior to 1984 and then we broke it, uh, used it as a separate survey in the model past 1984. And we did that specifically because there was a, a door change that made an actual real difference in the amount of ha Atlantic herring that they catch. So in past assessments and in 2015 and in 2012, we sort of merged that change in, um, uh, in the NIMS bottom trawl sampling from uh, Albatross to Bigelow using a conversion factor. This past assessment, we were actually able to put the Bigelow uh, time series as its own separate index into the model. Um, and that's because the calibration coefficients for Atlantic herring um, were, were somewhat, could, could be considered somewhat difficult um, because it is a pelagic fish that you're catching in a bottom trawl. And so now we've got, for just the National Marine Fisheries Service bottom trawl surveys, we've got six different indices, fall and spring, prior to 1984, um, past 1984 to 2009, and then post-2009. Uh, In addition, we also have the summer survey, which is you know, named the shrimp survey, uh, that covers a good portion of the interior Gulf of Maine and actually samples both um, inshore and offshore components. Next slide, please. Again, more bubble plots. Yay. Um, so in this, this is the time series for the Bigelow for fall. And notice that there's nothing past 2009, which is really good because they weren't running the survey past 2009. I'd be really worried if we did have data back there. Um, and you can again see that there's some strong year classes, again, starting here in the you know, 2008 range for age twos, 2006s, and again for 2008. What you don't see is age twos and threes in the 16 and 17 time frame. So again, even the fishery independent indices are showing that there's very few younger fish in the population. Next slide. 
So this new, uh, there's a new, uh, actually a new survey or a new index that we put into the model this time. This is an acoustic survey from, again, from the bottom trial. Um, it's a great research platform, by the way. Um, we can get so much data from it. Uh, so in this particular uh, index, what we, what's used is there's an actual um, uh, acoustic sounder on board and has been on board since about 1998. And so as it goes from place to place, as it does its bottom trawling, as it moves from station to station, it's continuously collecting acoustic information and acoustic signals from Atlantic Herring. And so um, Mike Jack from uh, National Marine Fishery Service actually cobbled this together into an index that we can actually use to survey the entire Gulf of Maine. And so from, from an analyst sort of perspective, what this does is, um, while there might be some difficulty catching Atlantic herring with a bottom trawl, this sort of takes that sort of information out of the picture. You, all, you just have to drive over them in order to see them as, as, as a good scientific index. And so um, we found this to be actually pretty useful in this particular assessment model. Next slide. So there were other indices in which we considered, but we ended up not putting in this particular model. Um, the first is the National Marine Fisheries Service Winter Bottom Trawl, or the Flat Fish Survey. And that's partially because it had lots of inconsistencies in its area of coverage. Um, it's, again, centered more on, on flatfish than Atlantic herring. Um, the state surveys um, were for Maine and New Hampshire, as well as Massachusetts, are, are, are important. But they only survey the inshore spawning component. They don't, you know, um, they don't actually survey the Georgia's bank component. And as a result, are probably not useful for a model that's based on the entire stock complex. And there's also uh, something new this year uh, that we try, which was a food habits index. And this basically is, as John describes it, using um, uh, um, predators like striped bass or monkfish or skates as an actual research plan. Uh, platform and actually using their information in their guts um, from the food habits database to figure out an index for Atlantic herring. Next slide. So on to, uh, on to the parameterization. Um, the, one of the first things, of course, that we need to talk about is natural mortality. Um, and so as I suggested earlier in this conversation, in 2012 we use a variable M at age. Um, which was scaled to a maximum age. So as you can see, if you can think about this, in 2012 we had a variable um, natural mortality um, that was static across all years, but in 1993 onward, it was ramped up by 50%. And that sort of matched this consumption that was coming out of the National Marine Fisheries Service Food Habits Database. So in 2015, we use this same sort of variable um, natural mortality at age, which we call Lorenzen, um, because it's based on size. But we, we didn't um, uh, do a 50% increase, and that's because there wasn't really any justification. It didn't solve the retrospective pattern, as I showed you. And it also didn't match the food habits database. And so that, that whole split of that 50% increase was actually not done in 2015. During this past um, assessment uh, in 2018, we actually removed the variable natural mortality at age. And we did that um, as a work group for, for a lot of different reasons. One is this idea of parsimony, um, the idea that your simplest answer is probably going to be your best answer. Um, more to the point, when we remove that sort of natural mortality at age, um, the model fit dramatically improved, or slightly improved, I should say. Um, and the other thing is that when we ran side-by-side -side comparisons using uh, natural mortality at age, uh, variable, and static at one number, there wasn't any difference in the results. We got the same results, we got the same reference points, we got the same pretty much everything. And so it was decided by the work group to actually use one value for natural mortality. Next slide, please. That value happens to be 0 0.35. Um, so that was the static natural mortality for all ages across all years for Atlantic caring. And when you do that, you get this black line, um, which is the assumed uh, consumption if you assume that fixed rate of natural mortality. The blue line is the results from the food habits 
database. And as you can see, it matches on some level. There's certainly a lot of variability, but it doesn't do quite a bad job um, at matching the food habits uh, data that comes out of uh, the National Marine Fishery Service. Note that these are all on the same scale. So they're not on separate scales. Next slide. Another pretty dramatic change in this model, and we, I kind of alluded to earlier, was about selectivity. So selectivity, or when these fish are actually the vulnerable to the fishing uh, that's occurring within the area. So in 2012, when we went through the benchmark, we ended up with this particular sort of selectivity curve for the, for the mobile fleet. Black line's mobile fleet. The blue line is the fixed gear. Um, so taking a look again at a sort of a reference age four, in 2012, age four was about 50% selected by the fishery, meaning that when they were mature, they were about 50% exposed or 50% vulnerable to the fishery. They were fully exposed by age five. I'm sorry, they were 70% exposed uh, at age four, my bad. During this formulation, they're 50% exposed to the fishery here at about, again, about age five, but aren't fully exposed to the fishery until age seven. And so what's happened is, is we've shifted that selectivity curve backwards um, or towards, uh, towards the right. That means that herring are older uh, when, they're first, when they're first and when they're completely exposed to fishing mortality in this fishery. Next slide. That actually has some, some, pretty, some pretty important implications. So before we can really talk about a lot of the results, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about recruitment, folks. Um, so on this axis is SSB, and on the y-axis is recruits. Um, and, and, and this kind of looks like you went out hunting for birds. Um, it's pretty much a shotgun sort of blast. And for those of you who are familiar with Menhaden or who are on the Menhaden board, you've seen this sort of pattern before. Um, it's pretty much the same issue that has arisen in Menhaden. There's a couple of things to note. One is that 15, 16, 14, they're all down here. So all of the recruitment over the last time, few years has been pretty low. More to the point, the difference at the same biomass between 2015 and 2008, there's a huge spread. That huge spread for the same biomass makes it almost impossible to figure out a stock recruitment relationship. There's that much variability. So thinking about it, that's a huge difference to have. That's a huge amount of variability to have at the same biomass over time. So the next slide. So the unfortunate part about all this is the model actually produces um, uh, recruitment over time. So here we are in the most terminal years. Here's a recruitment again. Here's year. And here is our recruitment recently. So as you can see from this particular, from this particular graph, 2016 was the lowest recruitment on record. Um, we've had low recruitment now. We're below median recruitment since about 2012. So this is our estimate of recruitment. I will note that the last two years have CVs that are greater than one. Uh, but as one of the peer reviewers pointed out, um, the CV on the last year was, was two. Even if you double that number, you're still below the median. So to sort of drive this point home, next slide, please. So. This is, this is the recruitment here. This will be your 2021 SSB. This next year will be your 2020 SSB, if you assume that they're fully mature at age four. And this will be your 2019 SSB. So pretty much for the next, for the next specification cycle, the recruitment's already there. We already have an estimate of it, and it's not particularly high. It's certainly below the median average. Next slide, please. 
So as I alluded to earlier, because it's such a shotgun pattern, we're unable to actually figure out a stock recruitment relationship. And so we're using median recruitment. Um, this means if you, if you look along this line, your recruitment from the model here is the same as it would be here. You get the same amount of fish for, the same, for, for surprisingly different levels of biomass. Next slide, please. This, of course, leads us to a problem with our reference points. In 2015, our reference points were based on a Brevard and Holt stock recruitment fit. We got this sort of MSY of 77,000, an F at MSY at about 0.24, uh, an SSB at MS, uh, MSY of 100, uh, 100, uh, 311, and the stock status was not overfished and overfishing wasn't, a, wasn't occurring. During this assessment, um, we don't really have an estimate of a stock recruitment relationship. So you can't produce MSY uh, reference points out of when you don't have a stock recruitment relationship. So as a result, we've started using an F, um, uh, SPR proxy um, at 40%. This sort, of, this sort of proxy, you guys might know it from Menhaden. Um, it's something that we, some do, we do in a very similar way. Uh, this sort of SPR at 40% um, is something that's used on the West Coast quite often. So this leads us to an MSY proxy, um, an MSY value of 112,000 metric tons, significantly different or significantly higher than the MSY value we had previously. The F and MSY proxy is about 0.51, that's nearly uh, that's a little bit more than double the F and MSY previously, but we should also note that that F and MSY applies to fully selected fish, which in this case are no longer age fours, but are now age sevens. And the SSB um, MSY proxy now is 189,000 metric tons. So this is quite a difference in biological reference points. Likewise, the biological reference points that we're currently using um, are no longer valid. You, you really can't justify them and you can't translate them. Next slide, please. So getting into more of the results um, from the document, we have biomass, year, we have in the red is total biomass, the dashed line is SSB, and the green line is exploitable. As you can see, total biomass, spawning stock biomass, and exploitable biomass. All of these were high back here in the 19, late 1960s uh, uh, and 70s, declined to the early 1980s, increased again um, in, the in the early late 80s, early 90s, has remained fairly flat until the 2000s, and then has taken somewhat of a, a shallow decline and then an increase in decline in the last few years as a result of low recruitment. The other thing to note is that in here, your total biomass and your, and your SSB have become closer and closer together. What this is saying is that most of your biomass now is SSB or mature fish, and that's that lack of recruitment that we've seen over the last few years. Next slide. Um, F sort of gives you a similar pattern um, to what you would expect um, over the time series where I want you to concentrate on the black line. Here's been your F which has been slowly declining here in the late 70s to the early 90s. There's been somewhat of an increase um, in the uh, mid 1990s all the way up to the late 2000s and then it's declined again. Next slide. So again, this is a standard control plot found for a lot of fisheries that you guys will see. So fishing mortality as a ratio of F and MSY here, spawning stock biomass as a ratio uh, uh, of its reference point here. The one one line is here. So. This line here is basically half 
your spawning stock biomass um, at MSY or your reference points, right? So this is your spawning stock biomass target. Here is your threshold. This is your F target. What you can see from the point estimate and the 80% confidence intervals is we're not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. There is not a non-zero probability that you're not, however, above F and MSY or overfishing, but it's not 50%. When you use a retrospective adjustment pattern, because even this particular model in this formulation has a retrospective pattern, you get very close to your F and MSY reference point. And your spawning stock biomass comes a little bit closer to one half BMSY. Next slide, please. I, I don't want to get into the weeds, but we do have a retrospective pattern associated with this, with this particular assessment. Um, the Moans row for um, for spawning stock biomass is not particularly high, but it is there. So there is a little bit of a retrospective pattern. There's a little bit of overestimating um, SSB and underestimating F. However, because it's within the 80% confidence intervals, generally there's not a correction factor applied to this. Next slide, please. So everyone's favorite topic and everything everyone keeps calling me about, projections. Um, so we ran two separate scenarios for the peer review for projections uh, for this year. One uses a bridge year or a 2018 catch of 111,000 metric tons, which is the actual ABC, and 55,000 metric tons, which was what was caught in 2017. Generally, the work group didn't really think that it was likely that this fishery was going to catch 111,000 metric tons. Um, it hasn't caught that amount for quite a while. Um, so going into the projections, we took a look at 2019 through 2021. We used F and MSY proxy. Basically, we projected forward if you caught F and MSY um, over the time series. And then we used a median recruitment um, because we don't have that sort of stock recruitment relationship like you would normally put in. However, we took out 2016 and 2017, and that's because in general, those are really, really high CVs associated with them. So we decided not to put them into the projections. The working group did sort of note that these projections will likely be optimistic if, um, if recruitment doesn't really pan out to go back to the median. Next slide. When you do this, you end up with um, sort of two sets of projections. The top one is at 111,000 metric tons. The bottom one is at 55. This is your catch on the first line in two th uh, here uh, under each year um, when you apply the F and MSY. So for example, in 2018, you catch 111,000 metric tons. You have a 95% chance of overfishing you have a 96% chance of being overfished. And then the following year, when you apply the F and MSY value, you have a catch of 13,000 metric tons, 13.7 thousand. But you're, you still have a high probability of being overfished. And of course, because you're fishing at F and MSY, your overfishing is not occurring. So. Looking at the, the 55,000 metric ton, which I think is probably going to be a little bit more realistic, um, as well as uh, given, you know, given this fishery's performance, as, as well as uh, pending actions by the council. So with 55,000 metric tons for 2018, you'll have a 70, roughly a 70% chance of overfishing, and there's a 76% chance that you will be overfished. By 2019, when you apply the F and MSY, you get a catch of 28,900 metric tons. You have a 92% chance of being overfished, below one half uh, of BMSY. And applying that sort of F and MSY, there's still a greater than 50% chance that you will be overfished by 2021. Next slide. So that's the good news. I'm just kidding. Um, 
So, wow, it's a tough room tonight. Um, <laughs> so for, for some final sort of thoughts, and, and Pat can stop me because he's seen this slide before, to sort of highlight, you know, the good thing is that you're not overfished and your overfishing is not occurring currently. You know, there's a limited retrospective pattern associated with this model as it's currently formulated. The model's got pretty decent diagnostics. It has good fits. There's not a lot of residual patterns. Um, the MSY, to my mind, is actually more representative of the long-term catch uh, associated with this stock than previous models. It's 112,000 metric tons as opposed to 77. Um, you have older age at full, at full recruitment to this fishery. Um, which means that herring are allowed to spawn at least a, a couple of more times before they're fully exposed to the, to the fishing mortality for this stock. Um, your F and MSY has gotten higher, and your biomass and MSY has gotten lower, suggesting productivity, right? The not so good thing about this sort of update in the assessment or this assessment benchmark is that the recruitment has obviously been off in the last few years. Um, it's not only just showing up as a modeling artifact, it's showing up in your catch, it's coming in your fishery dependent indices and your fishery independent indices. Um, this sort of lower recruitment has led to an erosion of the spawning stock biomass over the last few years um, and will more than likely um, lead to probably being over, you know, overfished in a very short amount of time. Um, the lack of, an, of, a, of a strong SR, the lack of a strong stock recruitment relationship means that you're going to be relying on proxies uh, for your estimates for, and for management purposes. There's a lot of stuff that's still uncertain within this particular model, right? So the CVs on the recruitment in the last couple of years um, are greater than one, which is pretty darn high. Um, the, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not this retrospective pattern will come back. Um, as we talked about, you know, there's, there's been a series of, you know, you do an assessment, you have a retrospective pattern, you fix it, and then you do an update and it's back. And that's the reason why John put up the DeLorean up there for the Back to the Future thing. Um, simply because it, we've been through this, we've been through this treadmill before. Um, so there's some uncertainty as to whether or not when we go to update this model in three years, whether or not the retrospective pattern will be back. Um, no, but none of us know because none of us have a crystal ball. Um, the other thing is, is that these, this use of F and MSY proxies can, be, can increase the uncertainty associated when, when doing things like setting OYs um, or in management, frankly, because we're not using F and MSY or MSY based reference points, but rather proxies. Next slide. So the peer review was conducted in June. Um, Pat Sullivan, who's also on the SCC, was the chair, um, and there were uh, the different people included uh, Kathy Dickmont, uh, Jeff Tingley, uh, Kobe Needle. Um, they, they were a good group, and they gave a lot of really good suggestions. Their report is currently not out yet, um, as I'm sure you guys have already heard about, uh, so I really can't speak to it. In general, they seemed fairly receptive. They gave they gave some really good comments. Um, and, and I, I thought they, that they helped and improved the model immensely. Um, but I, I don't expect for them to either reject or to completely, you know, change the model from what we have in the report. But I don't know that for sure. Next slide. So this is our summary. You guys have probably seen this table before. Um, it gives um, one of the... One of the interesting things is it allows you to take a look at your point F estimate of M F and MSY and take a look at how well we've done in the past about staying on top uh, or under that F and MSY target in the past retrospectively. You can also see the change in recruitment in a, in a table form. Note that 392 is what we have in 2017. That's slightly up from 2016 of 175. But it wasn't that long ago where it was closer to two or even 10,000. You know, so there's, a, there's been a, a fairly large drop in recruitment. Next slide. So I know everyone's always, always interested in the assessment and the assessment results. A lot of people don't actually read the appendices. Um, I read the appendices 
but you know. Um, so there's a lot of appendices associated with this model. Um, if, you, if you want more information, there's a lot of information on how we do aging. Um, that SAM state space model that's used in ICs a lot. Um, there's a, there's a run-through with Atlantic Herring. There's also consideration of what do you do when you have different models that are giving you slightly similar results but are off by just a little bit. And that's a thing on model averaging, um, which I'm sure you guys have, have talked about a little bit in the sort of risk and uncertainty framework. Um, there's also the, uh, that two area stock synthesis model um, that was done, which is also very interesting. I recommend that as a read. Um, as well as a study fleet program and using uh, predation pressure as an actual index uh, in a model like this. Um, one, of the, one of the cool things that, that we've noticed when we went through and we did this model is we actually have documented uh, occurrences of spring spawning in the Gulf of Maine, um, which is something that, you know, because the fishery hasn't been taking place, we haven't actually seen. But if you go out there in late May and in June, there are herring that are in spawning condition. I thought that was actually kind of cool because um, we haven't seen that in, in places in, in the Gulf of Maine in quite a while. Next slide. So here's the Herring Group working group members. Uh, they include my, you know, myself, uh, John, Chris Legault, uh, Deirdre, Sarah, uh, Ashleen, and Gary Shepard, who was chair. And with that, I think that's the last one. Huh? Yeah. That's it. I'll take your questions. Okay. Any questions for Matt? Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so would the layman's takeaway from this be that we're going to have to drastic, drastically cut quotas for a minimum of three years, I guess four years, and if we do not return to more normal recruitment, that this is going to be a fairly long-term problem. Yeah, if you don't, if 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 your levels of recruitment don't increase, if they don't go back to the median, then you know the stock will will be in a low state. You know, you can't take fish that that aren't there. Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could we go to the summary sheet? That was one of your last slides. Yeah. The answer to my question might have been 20 slides back, but why are we getting such poor recruitment from a sizable spawning stock biomass that I see in the third from the bottom line. What is the relationship? Is it, could it be traced to, is it traceable to fishing pressure? Is it traceable to environmental issues? I mean, what do you feel is the driver in the sudden drop, not sudden, but the continuing drop in recruitment, if that's a good question? Yeah, so the answer to your question is really is complex, right? I mean, you've got, you've got spawning stock biomass, for example, at this level, which is capable of producing almost next to, near next to no recruitment, or a whole lot of recruitment that you've never, like, recruitment like you've never seen before, literally. Um, there's no easy answer. We don't, really, we don't really know if there's an environmental driver um, if it's simply a match or a mismatch associated with whether or not larvae are in the water column at the right time, you know, it tends to be sort of hit or miss. Um, it has been four years in a row. I get it. Uh, for a lot of people, that's concerning, and, and I understand. I think it is. Um, but, you know, to deform, if you flipped a coin a hundred times, you would come up, there's a good chance that you could come up with heads four times in a row, right? So some of this is random chance. Um, 
So I don't think, we haven't really explored the idea of environmental covariates associated with recruitment, um, but it's, it's the last four years. And if you, two more slides. Forward, one, F, forward one, there. You'll notice that, you know, even in the last few years, we've still had pretty good recruitment, you know? I mean, this recruitment event back here in, you know, in, 2000, um, in 2009 or 2008, uh, I'm sorry, 2009, that's like, that's the third highest recruitment we've ever had in the time series, you know? And this is probably, I think, of, I think when I calculate it, is the sixth highest. So it's, it's hard to gauge whether or not some environmental drivers are, are at play here. Does that hopefully answer your question a little? David Pierce. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, a lot of work went into this. You, uh, of course, having a major role, so thanks to you and all of your colleagues for putting in this incredible amount of effort, appendices and otherwise. I mean, this, this was no small chore. It was, it was huge. A uh, couple of questions. I don't quite understand. How, how old is an age four, I'm see hearing? How long, I'm sorry, how large is it? The, the length, the length of an H4? <laughs> yeah, that, that was a trick question. Uh, it's, usually, it's usually above 23. About 23 centimeters, Correct. okay, all right. So Actually a little, bit, a little bit larger than 23, 20. Okay, I guess I'm trying to fathom why, I try to understand why um, age four fish are not yet fully selected for the fishery. Uh, why it's gone from four to seven. Uh, these are purseiners, they're midwater trawlers, they don't have large mesh, they're relatively small mesh. Uh, I mean, when the fish are, let's say, nine inches total length, thereabouts, which is kind of around age three or age four, they're caught by, they're caught by the industry, they're caught by the fishery. <coughs> if they're there, they're caught. So why has it shifted from four to seven, which is a very important conclusion that's been drawn. This fishery, the age fours were never fully, fully selected. They were actually fully selected usually by age fives uh, was when they were fully selected. Um, and selectivity isn't just about gear. Um, selectivity is also about is, is exposure to fishing pressure um, in the fact that they may be in a different location than where the, than where the fishing operations are taking place. Or they may be deeper. Or they, or they simply may, they simply may not be in the same area that all the other fish that are fully exposed to the fishery are. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of explanations, um, and you'll see it with menhaden as well as we talk about that. Physical cap, being able to be physically captured by the fishery is just one part of selectivity. Um, there's also whether or not they're they're exposed to the fishery, being in the same place, the same time, and at the right depth. Okay, thank you. So for whatever reason, uh, age four and age five and age six fish are no longer as available to the fishery as they used to be as part of the, a part of this selectivity uh, question. Um, it's perplexing. Uh, where are they? Are they all inshore so that they're, you know, not being captured by the, by the fisheries that tend to be a little bit more offshore, although the Persane fishery is fairly, fairly close to shore, isn't it? So I, I don't get that, but nevertheless, that's the conclusion that's been drawn. Uh, my other question is, um, f f looking at the spawning stock, first a comment. First, looking at the figure that shows spawning stock biomass going back over time and reflecting on when I was involved in sea herring fishery management back in the 1970s, we had concluded that the sea herring resource had collapsed. So, and that led to all sorts of very low quotas for a long period of time, and it led to uh, the decimation of the Massachusetts sea herring fishery, and just ended for all practical purposes. For, uh, I see now that we're at about that same SSB, so I'm kind of going to conclude that we pretty much are collapsed. That may be the inappropriate word to use, but that's what was used back then. So it looks like we have a collapsed sea herring resource based upon the SSB and, of course, the future recruitment that we expect to get. The question is, 2015, 2016, 2017, age one recruitment was extremely low. How does one assess 
in a timely way, real time, the, uh, the abundance of those young fish. What, what sampling gear, what survey was used to come up with those very low numbers of recruiting year classes age one? There's no longer a fixed gear fishery like it used to be. The fixed gear, if I, if I recall correctly, the fixed gear fishery stopped saying in weirs they were extremely important in judging the strengths of incoming year classes because they caught those small fish. So what do we now use to get this confident uh, conclusion that, um, that well, we're, we've gone to hell in a handbasket. Age, age 2015, 16, and 17, age one fish are pretty much you know, not there. So can you go to a slide that shows the SSB over time first? Uh, backwards, I think. Uh, forwards, yeah, keep going forwards. Yeah. No, other way. Towards the end, towards the results section. There's a graph with three lines. One's red, one's blue, one's green. Hold on a sec. Yep, that one. So yeah, you're right. I mean, we are a little, we are above the, the, the bottom of that curve for sure. Um, so we're not quite as, we're not quite as a bad spot as, as we were back in the late 1970s. Um, your second question dealt with, I'm sorry. How did you come up with yeah. reliable estimates of, of age one strength? Right. So you do actually have some fixed gear catches associated with this fishery. The New Brunswick fish, weir fishery is still in operation. And so that does provide us some pretty good reliable information on year class strength, as well as the NIMS bottom trawl survey does actually does catch, um, you know, f uh, decent incoming year classes. But as we've as we've suggested, those recruitment that that recruitment vector that we've seen um, has a fairly high CV in 2016 and even in 2015. You know, those CVs are are monstrous. In many cases, a greater than 50 percent. And so um, I think we're reasonably certain that the year classes aren't stellar, um, but the actual amount themselves is highly variable. And so that's the, one of the most uncertain portions of this model, um, is that incoming recruitment. You good? Yes, thank you, Matthew, presentation. Can we go back to the recruitment slide? Please. Yeah. Uh, nope. Yes, that one. So in the last specs package in 15, looking at this recruitment slide, you had an abundance of nine. It dropped off in 10, 11. It looks like it went back up in 12. And then it nosedived 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. How is manage as management bodies did we come up with the specs package that we did for 16, 17, and 18, looking at this recruitment slide. Have, can you give me an answer? Thank you. That's how. When you guys set your specifications package in 2015, you were working off the blue line. As opposed to the red line. To the red line. Now, now we, we adjust, you, you adjusted and we adjusted that for that, down to that black diamond, right? But adjusting things in the terminal year doesn't, doesn't really quite capture all that a retrospective badness does when it comes to management decisions. You can see that it drops your recruitment, right? It also drops your SSB 
a few years backwards from where, you know, from where you do the terminal adjustment. So it's not just the terminal estimate. That's not just the important part. Your recent recruitment, your recent spawning stock biomass are all lower. So you set stuff based on the blue line. The red is, is this year, and even that has a small, you know, when we went through and we did this and we did a retrospective peel, even that has a retrospective pattern. So even that red line's an overestimate. Thank you, Matt. Any additional questions for Matt? Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Matt. Um, so now you're, you're using a new tool, which is your acoustic survey. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Um, you know, what, what input did that have? Uh, was it different than your other sources of, of data? Um, how, and, and mostly, how was it conducted? We're just going on a boat ride and keeping the sounder on? I mean, that, that's what it looks like to me. If you want to put that graph up, I'd, that'd be fine. Yeah, no, it's, okay, so this is the, that is, this is the passive echo, echo sounder that's on the trawl survey, right? So they take these, you know, they, they go out and they do the trawl survey stations, but they move from place to place, right? So as they move from place to place, we're passively grabbing um, acoustic signal, right? And so, um, so it covers a fairly large swath of area, and it's taken over time. Um, for this particular model, there's, there's, you know, how that stuff, how that was done, there's a whole working paper in the appendix that talks just about that um, and how that was derived. Um, and I'm not the, the foremost expert on that. That was, that was Mike Jack that did all, the bulk of the work. However, in the document, there's a... Uh, there's a figure that's called, and I don't think I have it with me, that's called leave one out, right? And so in that, in that figure, we sequentially drop every single one of our surveys um, and, you know, uh, for each sequential run. And we do that to see what the influences are of those particular surveys. And every time we dropped any of these surveys, the estimate basically stayed within the 95, uh, stayed within the, the confidence intervals associated with the, with the terminal years, right, within the time frame. And so none of these, none of these um, surveys individually uh, carry a lot of weight within the model. They do carry a lot of weight together, right? And so it doesn't really give you that, it doesn't give you dropping that acoustic survey doesn't really give you that much of a change, right? As I remember, and you, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, as I remember dropping the acoustic survey slightly decreased the spawning stock biomass and slightly increased the fishing mortality. Um, but I would have to go back and actually pull up that figure to be certain. Uh, but that figure is in the document, and, it's, uh, and I forget which one it is, but it's called, uh, uh, it's basically called drop one. I'll set Eric. As my staff likes to tell me, it's not complicated, it's just complex. <laughs> you will follow up? Yeah. All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it, 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 it's, <clears throat> it's one of the two or all three, I'm not sure. But um, Mr. Jack and his staff of zero, the way I understand it, he is the staff in the acoustic business. Um, He'd much rather prefer a multi-beam sonar so you can see what you're actually looking at. And I don't know if they actually catch the fish that they ride over to, to make sure they know what they're looking at. Um, oh, yeah, but, they, they do, actually. Yeah, okay. and, they, and so that's, that's, that's part of it is, you know, they always, they always do, you know, an acoustic sounding. Um, and when they, when they do, it's not a dedicated survey by any stretch of the imagination. But they're out, it's in the, it's in the normal process of the NIMS bottom trawl sampling. And so they do, that's exactly it they have those estimates. Thanks, Matt. Doug? Matt, you mentioned in your last slide that you uh, discovered some spring, uh, examples of spring spawning. Is this uh, at a level that we should start considering spawning closures or was just a couple examples that you'd never seen before? Actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole working paper on this in the appendix section of the, of the assessment. Um, I think the estimate's at about 2%. Um, so um, uh, including or, or excluding doesn't really make a difference within this particular modeling framework. Um, but there is good evidence of spawning 
of spawning activity happening in May, um, which is completely surprising. Location where they were got? Is it George's Bank or or uh, inshore? In yeah, it's mostly it's mostly inshore. Before I take any additional uh, questions from the section, I'm going to uh, recognize John Hare from uh, Northeast Science Center. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to you know talk a little bit about the acoustic survey um, since the question came up from Mr. Reed. Uh, the Northeast Fishery Science Center used to have a dedicated uh, herring acoustic survey on the NOAA ship Delaware. When the Delaware was retired and not replaced in the region, that a de dedicated acoustic survey ended. Um, Dr. Jack, who's an acoustic expert, um, then used his expertise from that dedicated survey to go in and analyze the acoustic data coming from the Bigelow and came up with the index that was used in the assessment. So um, he is a staff of one, but he has a lot of expertise um, and has worked very hard over the past year to develop the data for use in this assessment, working closely with John DeRoba, the assessment lead. So I just wanted to provide that background. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Does, it, does anybody have any questions or clarifications from John on that? Seeing none, back to the section. Any additional questions um, for Matt? Seeing none. Um, as was stated, uh, we have a peer review that has not been finalized. Matt indicated that uh, the peer review uh, group uh, did have favorable comments. I'm not sure we're foreseeing any problems associated with its release, but that is yet to be known. Um, so. We do have uh, a stock assessment, obviously, that we just reviewed. Um, one, one way to move forward on this would be to accept, accept the stock assessment pending the approval of the peer review. Um, so it, that could be used from a management perspective. Um, Tony? I think that what we would do, unless you all want to do differently, we can give the peer review results at the October meeting, and then you could accept the assessment for management use then, um, or you can do a conditional approval, but that would mean you would approve it prior to hearing the results of the peer review, which I'm not sure that would be a more unusual thing. I guess because we're accepting the peer review for use in management, uh, the question is: is between now and and the <clears throat> and the October meeting, is there a potential that the herring section could be uh, brought together to, to uh, consider some management options, such as specifications? Tony, that'll be a discussion that we take up next, Doug. Um, that. You know, there's several ways that we can move forward, um, and Megan will have some information for the section to consider. Um, we could not do anything on the assessment for now, and we could come back to a motion to approve it if you want in some sort of conditional way based on the conversation that occurs after this, um, or we can just wait until October, or approve it conditionally. Uh, Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How, how does um, making this decision affect uh, the next agenda item? Tony. The next agenda item, so without spoiling, you know, Megan's going to let you all know that the there's potentially a change in how we're going to move forward in the specification process, in particular the timeline um, and what the New England Council is considering and what NOAA Fisheries will be considering. Um, there hasn't been a final decision, so this is still a prob, you know, possibility of how the timeline will change. But I think it's somewhat likely. But I'll let PK speak to that. Um, and so there will be some questions that the section will have to consider today. Um, and you can 
I think it's fine for you all to use this information as you consider that those those changes in the time frame and and recommendations that you want to make to NOAA Fisheries and and to the New England Fishery Management Council. Um, and the section will have to decide whether or not they want to conditionally change 2018 specifications or if you want to get back together and do a phone call to make some changes to specifications because we don't have all of the information in front of us today. But I think maybe the easiest thing to do is let Megan um, give some information, Pat, and then the section can decide what to do with the, um, with the assessment if, if you're willing to do that. Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree. I think uh, unless there is some objection from the section, why don't why don't we move into agenda item number six? We have information from Matt as it relates to the peer review now. Um, that will help potentially inform us in those discussions, and then we can make a determination if we need to make a, a motion in regards to uh, the peer review from a conditional perspective, um, addressing that questions and, and concerns, Richie, that you brought up as far as ma f further management actions. So with that, if, if there's no objections, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Megan then for uh, item number six. Keep in mind that we uh, have a lunch break on the agenda here, so uh, one good thing here is we can get through this presentation, uh, break for lunch, be thinking about this as we have a steak sandwich or a you know, bowl of fruit, whatever your, whatever your heart desires, uh, and then come back to the table with clear minds on, the, on a path forward. So, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we're first going to talk about the 2018 sub-ACLs. And before we get started, I just want to note, as many of you know, that there are a lot of moving parts for Herring right now. So we have the assessment we just heard. We have the Council's Amendment 8. We have a potential in-season adjustment for 2018. And then we also have 2019 through 2021 specs. And a complicating factor here is that while all of these actions are interrelated, they're happening on slightly divergent timeframes. So as a result, some of the things that we'll be discussing today are contingent on other actions happening. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of tee up those issues and show how they're related, but I do want to note that this section will be talking about some things that are one or two steps down the road today. Um, so in June, the council met and discussed preliminary results of the 2018 herring assessment, which Matt just noted indicates reduced biomass and poor recruitment over the last five years. And based on those results, it is expected that there will be severe cuts in catch, which will be implemented in 2019 through 2021. Um, and specifically, two of the projections that the council focused on were two that Matt showed. Um, the first one is the full 2018 ABC being harvested, which is the 111,000 metric tons. And that would uh, potentially result in a 2019 coastwide catch of 13,700 metric tons. And then the second one was half of that 2018 ABC. Um, and that would result in a 2019 coastwide catch of potentially 28,900 metric tons. So overall, what these projections are suggesting is that an in-season adjustment in 2018 could reduce the severity of cuts in 2019. So in light of this information, the council passed the motion, which is on the screen here, um, regarding the 2018 herring fishery. And it is recommending that the regional administrator allow for in-season adjustments for the 2018 fishery, such that the 2018 fishery would be capped at 2017 catch levels for management areas 1A, 1B, and 3. And then area two, the 2018, would be capped at 8,200 metric tons. And the reason that area two is slightly different is that they had already surpassed their 2017 catch levels. So that 8,200 metric tons is intended to provide some quota for the early winter small mesh bottom trawl fishery. So the table is a numeric version of that motion. So our first column is the current 2018 sub-ACL. So for area 1A, that's just over 32,000 metric tons. 
The next column is what's being recommended by the council. So again, for area 1A, that's the 28,682 metric tons. The next column is the difference between that. And then the final column is what is that percent of the original sub-ACL. So again, for area 1A, the recommended amount is 89% of our current sub-ACL. So why is the section talking about this? Um, if NOAA Fisheries makes an in-season adjustment, ASMFC will have different herring sub-ACLs in place for 2018. And this is because the section passed a motion in November of 2015 approving the 2016 to 2018 herring specification package. So if the section would like to align the state and federal sub-ACLs for 2018, we will need a motion to reconsider, and that will require a two-thirds majority vote. Um, as I kind of preface this presentation with, timing is a complicating factor here, and uh, it's important to note that NOAA Fisheries has not released action on the 2018 in-season adjustment, so unfortunately I don't have those final sub-ACL values to show to you today. So given some challenges with timing and the fact that we don't have those uh, 2018 values, from a staff perspective, there are kind of three actions for the section to consider today. The first would be no action, so that means the section would maintain the current or the existing 2018 sub-ACLs, and this could mean that the state and federal sub-ACLs would be different if that in-season adjustment is implemented. The second option is to make a motion to reconsider the 2018 sub-ACLs and make it conditional on action by NOAA Fisheries. So this will ensure that the state and federal sub-ACLs align, but again, we don't know those final numbers. And then the third option is to wait for action by NOAA Fisheries and then adjust, uh, address a sub-ACL change via a conference call. So under this option, the section would know what those adjustments would be, but it means that we may have to move quite quickly via a conference call after NOAA Fisheries action. So I'm gonna leave these three potential options up here on the slide for discussion, and we will uh, pass it off to the board chair when he comes back. Sorry about that, sidetracked. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, as you can see, um, based on the last slide, there are three potential actions for the section to consider. Um, before I open it up for uh, additional comments uh, from the section on the path forward, I think it would be, not to put you on the spot, Mike, but maybe I could bring you up to the microphone. Um, uh, so uh, Mike Pentney and uh, staff and I, uh, along with Tony, talked yesterday. Um, there, obviously, there is some difficulty in timing here. Um, I think it would be good to get your thoughts on this, Mike, and, and maybe we can uh, prod you a little bit for some information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so Megan did a really good job of laying out the council discussion uh, in June. Um, I might ask, actually, would it be helpful to this uh, brief discussion if if you could pull up one of the slides that was in Matt's presentation that showed the projected um, catch and fishing mortality rates uh, for 2018 uh, and 19 at the various. I think there was a table that showed uh, at the at the current levels and at the adjusted potentially adjusted levels. So, so as Megan, um, not that one, sorry. Um, so as Megan um, relayed, the council had a discussion similar to this section uh, in June based on the preliminary information coming out of the assessment and uh, obviously was very concerned with uh, what they were hearing um, and recognizing that one possible way to mitigate um, significant impacts to the fishery next year, thank you, that's exactly what I was looking for, um, to 
mitigate potential impacts to the fishery next year and the year after would be to reduce catch uh, in 2018 through an in-season action. Um, and as that table shows you, which was presented to the council, uh, or at least the information behind that table was available for the council, um, and as, as Matt and Megan both described, you know, at the 111,000 ton um, ABC we currently have, the projection is that next year's AB, uh, ABC would be on the order of 13,700 tons. Um, but if the catch was reduced for 2018 to 55,000 tons, uh, catch could be something on the order of 28,900 tons. So the council had the discussion about uh, requesting that the agency uh, under our authority in the regs uh, take an in-season action to adjust the 2018 specifications uh, to constrain catch to 2017 levels. And Megan showed the table uh, which uh, the council was using uh, based on preliminary information about 2017 catch uh, that was updated and, and the information that Megan showed you reflects the final catch for 2017. Uh, council also had a, a lengthy discussion about uh, area two uh, and the best way to uh, address that since it would have already have exceeded uh, its 2017 uh, catch when you factor in the, the adjustments and the in-season actions. So the council passed a motion 16-0-1 uh, to 1, uh, requesting that the agency take this in-season action. And I just want to highlight one aspect of, of that motion. I'm, I'm going to read, um, I'm going to reread it, uh, even though Megan showed it to you. So uh, upon approval of the 2018 stock assessment peer review, uh, the RA, under existing authority uh, allowing in-season adjustments, take action uh, to cap the 2018 harvest at 2017 catch levels and set the, 2000, and set the, the area 2 sub-ACL sub at 8,200 uh, metric tons. So the first part of that uh, is important. Uh, as you've heard, the stock assessment has not yet been approved, uh, so we are eagerly awaiting the final uh, results of that. And meanwhile, uh, although we are seriously considering the council's motion, uh, it is the action is still under consideration uh, pending uh, final review uh, and release of that stock assessment. So we have not made any final decisions yet on the council's request. Um, but I do want to highlight two things. The in-season adjustment regulation that the council uh, is referring to says that the specifications may be adjusted by NIMFS to achieve conservation and management objectives after consulting with the council during the fishing year. Any adjustments must be consistent with the FMP object objectives and provisions. And the reason I stress that last point, um, the, any adjustment must be consistent with the FMP objectives, is I want to point to the bottom table there, under catch at 55,000 tons, you can see that the probability of overfishing is 0.69. So generally, the, uh, the golden rule uh, is that we not set any catch levels that would have more than a 50 percent probability of resulting in overfishing. So the challenge for us as we look at the Council's recommendation and weigh uh, what to do is we feel that we cannot set specifications or, or make adjustment that would result in higher than a 50 percent probability of overfishing. Now what you don't have in front of you is what is that number. Um, Tony may have some information that she can share with you. We have been looking at some projections. Uh, you know, if you did a linear run from, from 111,000 and a 95 percent probability of overfishing uh, to the 55,000 ton with a 69 percent probability of overfishing, it might look very grim. Um, it's actually not a linear run, so it's actually not quite as bad. Uh, but what we are doing is we are looking at the Council's recommendation in light of this provision to ensure that we are preventing overfishing, uh, looking to set uh, an overall catch level consistent with that, um, taking into account the Council's recommendation, for example, that we set the area to sub-ACL at 8,200 uh, metric tons and that we try to preserve as much as possible the catch levels in the other three areas uh, as close to as possible their 2017 catch, uh, actual catch. Uh, and then we're also looking at what that might mean for 2019. I think we'll have that discussion probably uh, after lunch. 
Uh, but I realize you're probably not getting as much information as you'd like from me in terms of specifics. Um, but hopefully, if, uh, if Tony can share with you what the information that she has, um, then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, r reading between the lines and the fact that it's not a linear run uh, would leave me to believe that it's not as low as I was thinking it might be. But, Tony, do you want to comment on, on that? Recognizing that NOAA's still in their process, um, but that the section probably is not as comfortable um, making a change to an ACL if you don't have all the information in front of you. Um, uh, I have some information on projections that achieve a 50% probability in 2018, um, and I can give it to the group in sort of about numbers, um, and that in 2018 that that would leave a catch that's um, not quite but close to 50,000 metric tons, and in 2019 somewhere in the range of uh, 30 to 31 metric tons. A thousand metric tons, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, but that doesn't tell you how that information or how that catch would be distributed. Um, and so for today, as Megan said before, we can either consider um, making a change to the 2018 um, sub ACLs conditionally on what comes from the rule that NOAA is currently working on, or we could do a, um, a section could have the, a conference call following the rule coming out. Uh, thanks, Tony. Before I go to Matt, um, Peter Kendall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tony, those numbers. Uh, is that with the updated 2017 landing? We didn't have those as of the PDT last week. I believe so, but I can't, I'd have to go back to confirm that. Just, just something that Deirdre actually re and Jason reminded me that these are these are OFLs that we're talking about here, um, not ABCs. And so there's, you know, there's that thing to keep in mind as well. So those will be reduced by Canadian catch as well as um, uh, the SSC. You always bring a ray of sunshine into the conversations. <laughs> um, all right, b b back, back to the section. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Trying to think about the process here and our role, um, do I understand correctly that we today, we could change um, the quotas effective immediately? Am I correct in that or not? Uh, it, it depends on what you would want to do. I think that the best thing to do is to, if you approve something today, it should be conditional on what comes out of NOAA fisheries. So that would not be effective immediately. It would be effective after their rule, rule came forward. Um, right. I'm just trying, I'm trying to work through this process. So, so if we have that ability, then, um, so we can be more nimble and, and do things quicker. So can we then be an asset to the council and the service to put the put to put something in place that at this point it looks like they're in favor of, and then we could undo that if necessary going forward. My my understanding is it was for for our role today if we had all of the information was to give. It, advice on Area 1 and, and the breakdown of Area 1 and the sub-ACLs. I'm reading between the lines a little bit on what Mike said as far as the quota by areas that the rule that will be coming out in regards to that, you will be addressing those for 18 and 19. Not for 19. Okay. Just for 18. Okay. So 
on our plate today would be uh, in, in the memo that, that Megan sent around on July 20th, our role here today could be to um, deal with RSA, we could comment on RSA issues, we could comment on uh, um, fixed gear set aside for West of Color, um, there's probably two or three others that I'm not thinking of right off the bat, but those, what's that? That's for 19. That's, oh, that's for 19 then too. Just 19, I think, not 18. Okay, Tony? I think for 18, track. what you're looking at is just making a possible change to the sub-ACL okay. itself, right. just the numbers, everything else would hold. For 19, separate discussion later on, we can make some okay. recommendations to no fisheries as well as the New England Fishery Management Council on possible changes to a couple of, of factors within the document, which Megan can go through later. But And today before the section, it's just the question of do you want to do a conditional change um, that would be effective immediately when no fisheries comes out with their rule for the 2018 sub ACLs or do you want to wait have a conference call after their rule comes out and consider that change um, and because we've already set sub ACLs for 2018 it does require a two-thirds majority vote to make that change thank you Tony um, I'm going to David and then back to Peter Kendall yeah, first of all, I don't think it requires a two-thirds uh, majority vote because this was announced beforehand. When it's announced beforehand so the public knows it's coming, it can be a majority vote. Uh, so that, that's the way it usually works. If it's advertised, it's a majority. If it's not advertised, if it comes up at a meeting, then it's two-thirds majority. Anyways, apart from that, uh, we'll be discussing what to do after lunch. And frankly, um, because the vast majority of the sea herring fishermen have federal permits, the heavy hitters also really have an impact on what's being caught. I don't really think that what we do as a group of states is going to be of much consequence in terms of changing the numbers, because they're going to be affected by whatever the federal government does, 50,000 metric tons or so reduced to whatever number. So it's. Yes, it's good. it'll be good to get on the same page, but in terms of uh, um, the need to scramble to make a change, I don't see it since the federal permit holders. Thank you, David. Is there, is there any other questions or comments from the section? Seeing none, I think why don't we break for lunch, think about a path forward, and return back uh, at one o'clock and uh, and start the conversation again. That sound good? All right, sounds good. So we're adjourned until one o'clock.